engage in um, the historical task is important. Uh, the criteria that we use, the way we tackle the information is important. Often, and I've listened to many, many debates on the resurrection, methodology, if it is mentioned, it's very rare, maybe a little bit, and often it's just to score points against each other in debate. But methodology is important. There is a responsibility in debates on the resurrection to lay down what your methodology is and to explain to the public why you've adopted a particular methodology. Out of many, many debates that I have seen on the resurrection of Christ, debates between skeptics and Christians, methodology is not, a, is not dealt with as much as it should be. If you're going to use a methodology such as the Bayes theorem like Richard Carey, the atheist, it is beholden on you to be intellectually honest and to inform the public that your methodology is not used by most historians. A methodology, it should have a hermeneutical aspect, it should have historical criteria. What do I mean by comprehensive? Adolf Schlatter of 16th of August 1852 to 19th of May 1938 wrote over 400 papers on New Testament theology and New Testament studies. He ranked as one of the great theologians of modern times equal to that of Bultmann. His historical method is used in my debates. I have wanted to debate many atheists, but I've not been able to find many who were willing to debate me on the resurrection. But if they were to debate me on the resurrection, Part of my methodology is using Schlatter, Adel Schlatter. He, ad he advises the avoidance of sectarian bias, that you study all relevant material before you come to a conclusion. He seeks to understand the historical context of any ancient text. He gives equal time to primary source material and secondary source. Having a rich interplay between primary source historical material and contemporary scholars. Very often you will find with the atheist that number one they do not pay careful attention to historical data. So for example you will find and I've checked all the time I have checked with Richard Carrier, an atheist, his use of quotations from uh, the book of I uh, the song of Isaiah and other ancient texts and every time correct so it's important to pay particular attention to the historical data that we're looking at and to quote it in context which most of the time the skeptics fail to do but at the same time we must be intellectually honest and we must be willing to engage with the wider scholarly community. This again is one of the great weaknesses of the atheist community. If you read the atheist community or the skeptical community in their critique of Christianity uh, on the resurrection of Christ, you will find how very limited in their intellectual apparatus that they have. They cannot or very rarely will engage with the wider scholarly community. And so you have fringe scholars like Richard Carrier and agnostic scholars like, um, what's his name, um, Dr. Price, who are so fringe and, and, and incapable of actually engaging in the more richer, wider scholarly community. Uh, Dr. Price has been associated with the Jesus Seminar. That is a very limited part of the scholarly world in historical Jesus studies. So if you're going to debate on the resurrection of Christ, if you're going to show yourself to be competent, you need to be show that you've engaged with a wider scholarly community. For example, in this paper, 
I've mentioned Dominic Crossan, who I've consistently studied his material. I have mentioned Dale Allison, whose material I have studied. I have mentioned a whole variety of scholars that are completely different from my view, and I've honestly read them. And so your me methodology must be comprehensive and deep. And so my model is Adel Schlatter there. Secondly, you must have a methodology in understanding ancient text. It's no good quoting ancient text unless you put down and show us what you're using as a methodology. I use the historical grammatical method. I use a method where I try to look at ancient text whether the Bible or anything else in its historical grammatical context. That is very clear because often skeptics will quote text and we're not aware of the hermeneutical method they are using and how they use that method in the interpretation of and Hudwink by quotations from Bart Ehrman and by Richard Carrier, these kind of scholars who will quote a text but they are not giving us the methodology that they're using or, 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 and how they got to that quotation. If you want to know my methodology, go and read the books by Dr. Bob Utley, who is an expert. Uh, w, w, dot free Bible commentary dot org PDF seminar textbook by Dr. Bob Utley. So we, we, we have a methodology of depth looking at primary source material and engaging with contemporary scholarship. We have a, a hermeneutic of historical grammatical method. We have a historical we use a methodology that most scholars will use. I hope in my lecture to use the methods that historians use in assessing a hypothesis for historical data. This means my method tries to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also it is very important to note as we use the historian's tools it means we are using historical data as evidence not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. This is important because one or two skeptics have tried to straw man me here. They've tried to suggest that my belief in the Bible is the word of God is influencing my, in my understanding of the historical data. But I have been upfront and honest that I have presuppositions. But also the skeptic has to be honest that they have presuppositions. Discussion, even though my presupposition may be the inspired Bible, my argument does not rest on an inspired Bible, but upon historical method that secular historians use. So therefore, this argument against me would be a straw man. Number one, the historical method that historians would generally use is number one, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of the facts that our hypothesis accounts. The hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope. Second, explanatory power. This looks at quality of the given facts. If you can explain your position with a less ambiguity, then it has better explanatory power. If one has a strong presence, you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history. The hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than any other position. We look at opposing views and see also if they conform, confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, hat less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that lack like any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems, and if this is the position, it strengthens one case, one's case. 
page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lycona on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. The historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona. Not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical facts and come to some objective understanding but we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time we can look at reality of the facts. They are there. Facts are facts. But there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. Dr. E.P. Sanders has noted has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with now what the atheists do not tell you what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-christianity they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection, like Dr. Carrier, Earl Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that 